Chronicles. We'll be in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. In 1945, there were three men who became very well known for their preaching. The first of those men was a man named Chuck Templeton. One seminary president, after hearing Templeton preach to an audience of thousands, called him the most gifted and talented young man in America today for preaching. In 1946, one year later, the National Association of Evangelicals published an article of men who were best used by God. The article highlighted the ministry of Chuck Templeton as the one best used by God. The next man was a man named Braun Clifford. Clifford was 25 years old in 1945. Most people believe that he was the most gifted preacher the church had seen in centuries. In 1945, Clifford preached to a packed auditorium of over 10,000 in Miami, with people lined around the stadium 10 deep who could not get in. One national leader wrote, at the age of 25, young Clifford touched more lives, influenced more leaders, and set more attendance records than any other clergyman his age in American history. The third man, who seemed to come out of nowhere and began to fill auditoriums across America, preaching to as many as 30,000 a night. His name was Billy Graham. Now, we know the name of Billy Graham, but I'm going to guess most of you have never heard of the other two. How many have ever heard of Templeton? Possibly if you have, it's because you've read a biography of Billy Graham. My guess is probably none have heard of Clifford. All three great preachers. All three attracting thousands in the stadiums to preach to. But years later, we only know of one. Why are we not familiar with the other two? What happened? I believe the answer is in the scriptures we're going to look at today. So let's read together, starting with 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I'll warn you, we're going to look at a lot of scripture today. We're going to actually look at three chapters in 2 Chronicles. But, so, so just hang in there. But 2 Chronicles chapter 16, we're going to start with the first verse. In the 26th year of Asa's reign, King Basha of Israel invaded Judah and fortified Ramah to keep anyone from going to or coming from King Asa of Judah. Then Asa brought out all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He sent them to Damascus, to Aram's king, Benhadad. He said, there's a treaty between you and me as there was between your father and my father. I'm sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with King Basha of Israel so that he will leave me alone. Benadad did what King Asa requested. He sent his generals and their armies to attack the cities of Israel. He conquered John, Dan, Abel, Nahum, and all the storage cities in the territory of Naphtali. When Basha heard the news, he stopped fortifying Ramah and abandoned his work on it. Then King Asa took everyone in Judah to Ramah. He made them carry the stones and lumber from Ramah. Basha had been using these to fortify the city. Asa used the materials to fortify Geba and Benjamin and Mizpah. At that time, the seer Hanani came to King Asa of Judah and said to him, Because you depended on the king of Syria and did not depend on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped your grasp. Weren't the Sudanese and Libyans a large army with many chariots and drivers? When you depended on the Lord, he handed them over to you. The Lord's eyes scan the whole world to find those whose hearts are committed to him and to strengthen them. You acted foolishly in this manner. So from now on, you will have to fight wars. Did you catch that? King Asa had ceased trusting God and began trying to handle the problems himself. 
I think the whole problem is what we find in verse 9. The Lord's eyes scan the whole world to find those whose hearts are committed to him. The whole problem lies in the heart, not totally surrendered to God. Now this morning, I want to help you to understand what totally surrendered to God means. So I, I need our kids to come and help me this morning. Any of our kids who would, but to come up front, make your way up here. All right. Now I asked Jesse earlier to help me, so 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 he's going to be the object of us. So you guys have to have to answer my questions, okay? Now I asked Jesse to get in the tub. Now I'm going to ask you: Is Jesse in the tub? Okay, they said Jesse. Let me ask all of you: Is Jesse in the tub? Partway. Now, now they're over here first saying, yeah, 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 he's in the tub. Most years say, no, 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 he's in the tub. Okay, Jesse, let me ask you, are you in the tub? Yes. Yes, okay. But let me, can, can anybody see him? Yes. Yes, so are you completely in the tub? I want you to completely get in the tub. Okay? Let's see what you do. All the way in. There we go. Now, is Jesse in the tub? Yes, he's in the tub, with room to spare, matter of fact. He is completely in the tub. If I had to leave, I could put the lid on the tub, and we could pick him up and carry him away. But, but he is completely in the tub. All right, Jesse, you can stand back up. And here's why I showed you that this morning. Because a lot of folks, in their commitment to God, they say, I'm totally committed. They're in Christ, but they're not totally in. See, I think the difference between being total commitment and commitment is this is commitment. He is actually in the tub. But then Jesse showed us how to totally be in the tub. And that's what I want you to remember this morning. Is we're not just committed to Christ. Jesus tells us to be totally committed to Christ. Let's give them all a hand. Thank you, guys. Great job. The problem was Asa, who was committed to God, was not totally committed to God. And, you know, often that happens in our lives. Let me ask you, has it ever seemed like your Christian life has more ups and downs than a roller coaster? This day you're soaring with eagles. Next day, you're wondering if your friends and neighbors would even identify you as a Christian. And it seems like the Christian life often is, is more up and down and, and up and down. Our text clearly says, The Lord's eyes scan the whole world to find those whose hearts are committed to Him and strengthen them. So my question this morning is going to be this. Is your heart totally loyal, totally surrendered to Christ. Can you without hesitation say, my heart belongs completely to God. This morning, I want us to look at the story of King Asa because I want us to see what total commitment looks like. And so, so as we start, I want us to see a heart totally surrendered to God. Now, the challenge to maintain a heart totally surrendered to God is actually found not in chapter 16, but earlier in Asa's story. So we're going to back up to chapter 14 and chapter 15. And, and the irony of what we find in chapter 16 is at that time, Asa, who had been committed to God, was no longer trusting God. In chapter 14 and 15, we find five evidences of one who was totally trusting God. So I want us to look at those. And the first evidence is this. A heart that is loyal to God deals seriously with sin. A heart that's loyal to God deals seriously with sin. And notice I put seriously in there. Deals seriously with sin. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Let's start in verse 2. Asa did what the Lord his God considered good and right. 
He got rid of the altars of foreign gods, wrote down the sacred stones, cut down the poles dedicated to the goddess Asherah. He told the people of Judah to dedicate their lives to serving the Lord God of their ancestors and follow his teachings and commands. He got rid of the illegal places of worship and the altars for incense in all the cities of Judah. The kingdom was at peace during his reign. If you're going to be totally surrendered to Christ, then we have to deal seriously with our sin. And we have to, let's start by calling it what it is. Sin is sin. In our society, in our day, in our time, in our lives, we try to lessen our sins. We call it other things. We call a lie a fib. We call murder a choice. What we've done is we've tried to take our sin and we've tried to lessen it just kind of so that it don't sound so bad. So that we don't feel as bad about it. So we have to begin by just calling it what it is, sin. Verse 2 said, Asa did what the Lord his God considered good and right. Folks, if we're not doing what is good and right, then we have to deal with that. We have to seriously deal with that. Jesus taught us. If your arm causes you to the sin, what does he say to do? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now Jesus wasn't telling us to wipe off our arm. He's teaching us the seriousness of dealing with our sin. One of my favorite movie scenes comes from the movie Fireproof. And in that movie, Caleb is struggling with a lot of stuff. But Caleb, one of the things he's struggling with is internet pornography. And if you've ever seen the movie, you know what happens. He goes to the computer, and he can replace his wife with internet pornography. And he's at the computer, and he's sitting there, and all of a sudden this, this picture pops up. And, and, he's, and he's, he's toyed. He's tempted. He's there with his mouse scrolling over. All I have to do is click. But he knows. He, at that point in his life, he knows he has to deal seriously with his sin. So then you see it, those ways. He, he doesn't just get up and walk away. He doesn't just turn the computer off. He takes his computer outside and takes a baseball bat and beats it to pieces. Why? Because if we're going to be totally committed to Christ, we have to seriously deal with our sin. Not just go, oh Lord, I'm sorry. We have to get it out of our lives because that's total commitment. The second thing is, a heart that is loyal to God enjoys divine blessings. Back in chapter 14 again, starting in verse 8, or verse 6. He built fortified cities in Judah because the land had peace. There was no war during those years because the Lord gave him a time of peace. So Asa told Judah, let's build these cities and make walls around them with towers and doors that can be barred. The country is still ours because we have dedicated our lives to serving the Lord our God. We have dedicated our lives to Him, and He has surrounded us with peace. So they built the cities, and everything went well. Asa had an army of 300,000 Judeans who were armed with large shields and spears, and 280,000 Benjamites who were armed with small shields and bows. All of these men were good fighting men. I want you to notice the progression here. When Asa deals seriously with sin, then God blesses him. How does God bless a king? He gives him peace. Most of Asa's reign were years of peace. So he gives him peace. He provides for him a great army. He allows him to, to build great cities and great fortified cities. God is blessed because he dealt seriously with sin. God blesses him. Often I run across folks and those, God's just not blessed me like I've seen in Scripture. Or perhaps the reason is we have to seriously deal with our sin. And then once we do, then God is free to bless us. Because a heart that is loyal to God will enjoy divine blessing. The third thing that we see from Asa's life is a heart that's loyal to God depends on God. He's going to trust God. He's going to depend on him. Chapter 14, verse 9. Then Zerah from Sudan came with one million men and three hundred chariots to attack Asa. Zerah got as far as Moresha. 
Asa went to confront him, and the two armies set up their battle lines in the Zephyr Valley of Marisha. Asa called on the Lord his God. He said, Lord, there is no one except you who can help those who are not strong so they can fight against the Lord's army. Help us, Lord our God, because we are depending on you. In your name we go against this large crowd. You are the Lord our God. Don't let anyone successfully oppose you. I want you to hear something this morning. I want you to remember something. Just because there is peace doesn't mean there won't be problems. Just because there's peace does not mean you won't have problems. I can promise you this. If you are dealing seriously with your sin, then God will be blessing you. And if God is blessing you, then you will be attacked by the enemy. There is no doubt about it. It will happen. Often I have folks say, well, the devil just doesn't seem to be bothering me then that tells me you're probably closer to him than you are Jesus. But if you are dealing seriously with your sin, God's going to be blessed. And if you do, if he's blessed, the enemy will attack. King Asa realized he couldn't fight the enemy attacks alone. He needed God. He didn't just come to God out of desperation. He knew his need for God. And my friends, there is no area of your life right now that you can say, I've got this. You need God. A heart that's loyal to God depends on God. The fourth thing is, a heart that's loyal to God is devoted to obedience. A heart that's loyal to God is devoted to obedience. Jump to chapter 15 now. Now we can read the first 15 verses, but let's start at verse 8. When Asa heard the prophet Obed's words of prophecy, he was encouraged and put away the detestable idols from all of Judah, Benjamin, and the cities he had captured in the mountains of Ephraim. He also repaired the Lord's altar in front of the Lord's entrance hall. Then Asa gathered all the people from Judah and Benjamin and the foreigners who had come from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon. Many of them had come to him from Israel when they saw that Asa's God, the Lord, was with him. In the third month of the fifteenth year of Asa's reign, they gathered in Jerusalem. On that day, they sacrificed to the Lord a part of the loot that they had brought with them, 700 cattle and 7,000 sheep. They made an agreement with one another to dedicate their lives to serving the Lord God of their ancestors with all their heart and soul. All people, young and old, male and female, who refused to dedicate their lives to the Lord God of Israel were to be killed. Asa and the people swore their oath to the Lord with shouts, singing, and the blowing of trumpets and ram's horns. All the people of Judah were overjoyed because of the oath, since they took the oath wholeheartedly. They took great pleasure in looking for the Lord, and he let them find him. So the Lord surrounded them with peace. Here's what we see in chapter 15. Chapter 15, we see the total surrender of King Asa to God being taken to a deeper level. This is the place of surrender that, that I find often is a wall for Christians. We say, you know, Lord, you've done this for me, or I've done this for you. Lord, I've surrendered these things to you. God, you've changed this in my life. But it's at that place where God says, but what about this? God, I, you, you, you've changed me, you've made me better. God says, but what about this? Lord, you, you bless me so well. But God's saying, but what about this? I want to tell you something. Week after week, I see that same struggle on the faces of folks in our congregation. Week after week, I watch and as God, I, I've done this for you. I'm in church. I've been in church for weeks now. God, I prayed yesterday. God, I read my Bible. God, I'm doing this for you and you're doing this for me. But God says, what about this? I want to show you an illustration of what I think God wants to do in you. This morning I brought a glass. And my, my goal this morning 
is to fill this glass with water. So I'm going to take my water and I'm going to fill it up. Now when I was a child and, and, and I would ask my mom for a drink and she'd bring my drink to the table, it usually looked like this. And every mama knows that's because if you spill it, you don't have as much to clean up. So, so that, that's kind of, this was a full glass when I was a child with my mother. But if you went to a restaurant and you asked for a glass of water and they brought you this, would you be happy? So no, you want the glass full, right? So they're going to bring you something like this. And you're going to look at that and you're going to say, okay, I have a full glass of water. And, and, and you'd be satisfied with that in a restaurant. You're not going to say anything. But often when we look at that and we say, that is full. God's blessed us. God's done good things in our life. He's made changes. I'm not the person I used to be. So I am committed to God. But you know what God wants to do in our life? Is God wants to look at those things. When we say enough, that's enough for it. I'm where I need to be. But God says, what about this? God has other areas. He, he, wants, us to, he wants total commitment. Full surrender. So I don't know how well you can see it in this pan. Because the pan's kind of tall. But, but I, I wanna, I'm going to fill the glass up. Because when I look at it. I would then say, that is a full glass. Because look at that, and you can tell that's just about as full as you can get. And a lot of times, we're, we're happy with that. Because God has really blessed in our life. He's actually made some great changes in my life. So I say, I'm totally, totally committed to God. But you ever notice, as you're filling a glass of water, if you get really close and down level with it, right before that glass overfills, there's this point where the water actually stands just a little bit above the rim. Before it fills. So even that is not a full glass. Because you know what God wants? He wants total commitment. He wants full surrender of our everything. So God doesn't want partial. He doesn't want even that. What God wants to be in our life is he wants to be full and overflowing. So that all will know that God is at work in our lives. When we look at, at what God wants to do, Asaph was at that place where God says, what about that? And Asaph said, okay. Asaph was at that place where God says, I want you to be devoted to me in obedience. A heart that's loyal to God is devoted to obedience. But I want to show you a fifth thing. And that's that a heart loyal to God demands obedience from others. In chapter 15, verse 16, I find what, what I think is quite humorous in the story of Asa. Here's what it says. King Asa also removed his grandmother Micah from the position of queen mother because she made a statue of the repulsive goddess Asherah. Asa cut the statue down, crushed it, and burned it in the Kindred Valley. Now, some of your translations aren't going to say his grandmother. They're actually going to say his mother. And this is why I find this humorous. Because King Asa is, wants to be totally surrendered to God. And to do that, that's going to demand obedience from those around him. And whether you look at it as his mother or his grandmother, Asa's going to go to this woman and say, because of your sin... Because you've done wrong, I'm removing you from your place and your position. Could you imagine going to your mother and saying, Mom, you're wrong. And because of that, I'm going to punish you. How many would do that? Maybe one time. And, or, or your grandmother. Grandma. You make such excellent cookies. You give such great hugs. But you've been bad, so I'm going to punish you. You are no longer going to be my grandma. Would we do that? No, but that's what King Asa did. Because one who is totally committed to God is also that around them. They need the obedience from others. So when we look at our lives, we need to ask ourselves, are we totally committed to God? Have we fully surrendered? Because one of the ways to see that is do we require that from those around us as well? 
We look at his life. And here we've seen in chapter 14 and 50 five awesome things of one who's totally surrendered. But then we move to chapter 16. We read that earlier. What happened? Asa went from a man surrendered to God to a man trying to fix his life his own self, his own way. He, he went from a man committed to God, fully surrendered, to a man that's saying, we got a problem. Tell you what, let's take all the gold and the silver from the temple treasury, and I'll throw in everything from my house, and we'll send it to a neighboring king and tell him to come fight for us. And maybe if we pay him more than the other guy paid him, he'll switch sides and come and fight for us. That's what he did. What happened? If you hear nothing else I say today, I want you to hear something. I'll write it down if you need to. But here it is. Your devotion to God in the past does not guarantee your devotion today. Your devotion to God in the past does not guarantee your devotion today. From chapter 16, I want us now to see the consequences of a heart that is not completely surrendered to God. A heart that is not completely surrendered to God. I want to see some things about that. First thing is, a heart that does not completely surrender to God will begin to rely on their own strength. We read that those verses, verses 1 through 7 in chapter 16. And you remember when, when the enemy came to attack, Asa didn't do what he did before. Before when the enemy came to attack, he said, God, we need your help. We know that we cannot not attack any enemy on our own. God help us and God did God has blessed him with peace. God has blessed him with armies. God has blessed him with towns. But now he's in the place. Another enemy's coming. And he says, let's fix it ourselves. How much money you got? What, what do we have in the treasury? Who do we know that we can call on? Let's fix this ourselves. A heart not fully committed to God will be one who relies on their own strength. Look at the results in verse 7. Chapter 16, verse 7 says, Because you depended on the king of Syria and did not depend on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped your grasp. Now, he can look at the story and go, Well, well we, we were okay. They quit what they were doing. We made them pick up and run. But they didn't have victory. But you know, often when we're relying on our strength, we settle for something shorter than what God wants to do in our lives. Asa was going, uh, you know, we were okay. But the truth was, they didn't have victory. God wanted to, before, God gave them victory. And we do the same in our lives. Lord, I, I, I got that one, I fixed it. God's probably up there going, not like I'd have done it. I, I'd have done it far different, far better. But you settled for less. A heart that's not completely surrendered to God relies on their own strength. The second thing I want you to see is a heart that does not completely surrender to God will begin to restrict the blessings of God. Remember all those blessings we read about in chapter 14 and 15? All those things that God did in his life? God reminds Asa of them in verse 8. Chapter 16, verse 8 says, Weren't the Sudanese and the Libyans a large army with many chariots and ground? Remember, a million soldiers, 300 chariots. But when you depended on the Lord, he handed them over to you. But because he no longer trusted God, verse 9 tells him this, Now you will have wars. This is a man that God had blessed with peace. Oh, yeah, the enemy attacked, but God's a care of it. But now he says, you will have wars. Why? Because when our, we're not totally committed to God, our blessings are restricted. I heard a story once, and I know it's a fictional story, but I, I imagine, what if it happened? What if the day 
we go to glory. As a born again believer, we're there, and Jesus has given us a tour of heaven. And we come around and we come to this room full of blessings. I said, well, what is this? Jesus says, well, that's what God wanted to do in your life. But you fixed it on your own. A heart totally committed is blessed by God. But one who, who's not, God's blessing is restricted. The third thing I want you to see is a heart that does not completely surrender to God will begin to reject God's instruction. We didn't read this verse earlier, so let's look at it now. Chapter 16, verse 10. Asa was furious at the seer. This is the guy who came to him and says, Hey, this is what God says. Asa is furious with him. So he was angry with Hanani that he was so angry with Hanani that he put Hanani in prison. Asa also oppressed some of the people at that time in his reign. King Asa was so mad that when he became confronted with the truth, he put God's messenger in jail and made life tough on everybody else around him. You're thinking, oh my. But I can guarantee you this. That same thing will happen today. Right here today, that same thing will happen. There will be folks who when confronted with the fact that they are not totally surrendered to God. They're going to attack the preacher. Oh, they'll, 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 they'll just little snippets. Those things that they say. Those looks. Those comments to others. Just because they've been confronted with the fact they're not totally surrendered to God, there's lacking in their life, they're going to attack somebody else. It's the preacher's fault. Or, there'll be folks that when confirmed with the fact <coughs> they're not totally surrendered to God, they'll refuse to go to church anymore. Now, they'll never say that. I don't know that I've ever heard anybody say, <coughs> well, I'm not going to that church because they preach the word of God and it hurt my feelings. You know what they do? They blame something else. I tell you what's the popular belief right now. COVID. You know, I can't go to church because of COVID. I've heard so many excuses over the last month. I'm so tired of hearing excuses. I've heard every reason under the sun <coughs> why like folks aren't coming to church. But you know what the total is for the most of them? There's something lacking in their life. And they're using that as an excuse to cover up something else. Or, when we're front confronted with the fact that <coughs> we don't, we're not fully committed to God, there will be folks go home today and life in their home is going to be rough. It's going to be awful. Because they're going to be mad. They're going to be grumpy. They're, they're going to snap out at others because of what's going on in their life. And you know when this happens, that shows us the fourth thing. And the fourth thing is that a heart that does not completely surrender to God will begin to refuse to seek God's help. Chapter 12 gives us one of the saddest statements of Asa's life. Here's what it says. Chapter 16, verse 12. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa got a foot disease that became progressively worse. Instead of asking the Lord for help, he went to the doctors. Now, let me pause for a moment, folks, because I want you to understand something. I am not telling you not to go to your doctor. <coughs> I believe that God works miracles today through modern medicine. I believe he uses that in great things. So I'm not telling you to go to your doctor. But here's what he's telling us about Asa. Here's Asa who called on God to, for help in an army of a million soldiers and God delivered them to him. Here's Asa who commands a kingdom of a land that didn't trust God. And he led them to trust God and brought peace in the land. But now when he's sick, it says he went to the doctors. 
And notice the, 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 the S on there. Because here's what I think Asa did. He went to one and they couldn't help him. He went to another and they couldn't help him. And he went to another. He's the king. He probably had every doctor in the land see him. But he didn't trust God. He refused to seek God's help. After everything he'd seen God do. After all the times God had blessed him. When he got sick. Instead of going to God, he went to the doctor. A heart that's not completely surrendered to God will refuse to seek God's help. In 1945, three preachers took the world by storm. We've already discussed, we know the name Billy Graham. I doubt that there's very few Americans who's never heard the name Billy Graham. But what about the other two? I did a little research. Just five years later, Templeton left the ministry to pursue a career in television and radio. By that time, Templeton had decided that the message of Christ was no longer true. By 1950, five years later, after being considered one of the greatest preachers, filling stadiums, by 1950, he no longer believed in the validity of the gospel or the claims about Christ. How about Braun Clifford? We didn't heard of him. Because by 1954, nine years, he's up being 10, nine years later, he had lost his family. He had lost his ministry. He had lost his health. And by the end of the 10th year, he will have lost his life. Alcohol and financial irresponsibility had taken everything. Before his death, he had left his wife and his two children. At age 35, just 10 years, that once great preacher died from cirrhosis of the liver in a rundown motel in Amarillo, Texas. Some of the pastors in Amarillo took up a collection to buy him a casket so they could bury him in the poor man's cemetery. Asa's story prompts us to ask ourselves a serious question. It prompts us to ask a question about our heart. And here's the question. And it's a question that each one of us has to answer. The question is, is there anything in my life that does not right now belong to God? Is there anything in my life that right now God doesn't have control of? I'm not surrendered to Him. You know that idea of surrender? That's a serious thing. During World War II, Germany is surrounded by Allied forces. A few days after Hitler's suicide, the, the Germans surrendered to the Allies. The, the actual wording of the surrender document contains these words. Here's what it says. The German command agrees for all German forces to lay down their arms and to surrender unconditionally. Now, when God wants our surrender, that's what he wants, unconditionally. But it goes on to explain something in that document of surrender. Furthermore, the Germans agreed to carry out at once and without argument or comment all further orders that will be issued by the Allied powers on any subject. Do you hear that? What is total surrender? Total surrender is carried out at once without argument, without comment, any further orders on any subject. Are you willing to say that to God today? Are you willing this morning to say to Almighty God, at once, without argument, without comment, I will carry out all of your orders, no matter what they are. That's what total surrender is. So that takes me back to my question. Is there anything in my life right now 
that does not belong to God. Maybe you're here this morning and the first thing is you don't belong to God. Because all your life you've been trying to save yourself. And maybe you're doing that by coming to church. Maybe you're doing that by, by being here Sunday after Sunday. Maybe you're doing that by, by reading your Bible. You're trying to save yourself. But you can't do it. And you realize that everything you do falls short. And today, your surrender is to believe on Jesus Christ that he died on the cross. And that it was enough because the third day God raised him from the dead. And you transfer your trust from yourself to lay on Jesus. Maybe today is the day of your salvation as you trust Jesus. Or maybe you're here as a believer and you're up against that wall. God's been doing stuff in your life. God's been changing you. God, God, God's, God's blessed. But you know, you know there's that area right now that God's saying, what about Maybe this morning it's time to take that to God. Ask His forgiveness. Turn from that sin and follow Jesus. Fully surrender to Him. Is there anything in your life right now that doesn't belong to God? So let me tell you what to do about it. As we pray, you pray. Just go, go to God in prayer. Confess that sin. And trust Him. Ask Him to forgive you for it. Turn from it to follow Jesus. But just trust Him. Say yes to whatever He wants to do in your life. Total surrender. Is there anything in your life right now that doesn't belong to God. Are you going to change that? Or are you going to walk out that door and still not give it to Him? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for showing us the example of total surrender. And thank you for showing us what that does to God. Thank you for your spirit that digs deep into our lives to speak to our hearts for the desire to change us. And Lord, we know you leave that up to us. You let it be our decision if we want to be totally surrendered or not. But God, my prayer is that for every person, everyone who hears this message, for every area that they know that you're saying, what about this? They will give that to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.